everyone. I'm Gretchen Crosby Sims, Executive Director here at the Institute of Politics. We are pleased to welcome Alex Wagner to campus this evening, and we're looking forward to her discussion with Dr. Gina Samuels. Her book, Future Face, is available for sale, and we'll, she will be signing copies after the program. I want to mention a few upcoming events. Next Tuesday, we have Assistant Secretary of Defense Randall Shriver, who will be giving us a really interesting uh, inside view of the Trump administration's foreign policy on India, North Korea, and China. Wednesday at lunch, we will be hosting a few recent IOP alumni for a students-only conversation about their work on the campaign trail in 2018. Wednesday evening, we have Julian Castro, former Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, who will be discussing the future of the Democratic Party. You can find out more about these and all of our events on our website at politics.uchicago.edu. We will have audience questions after um, the conversation. Uh, please, during the conversation, please make a note of anything you want to ask about. We're going to have a microphone that's going to be in the center aisle. Um, we remind you that we give the first three questions to students and that a question ends in a question mark. Ask you, please, to put your phones on silent. And um, the restrooms are downstairs if you need them. Here to formally introduce our speaker is Riddy Sungham. Riddy is a fourth year from Saratoga, California, studying economics. During her time at the IOP, she's been involved with both the Women in Public Service program and The Gate, uh, the IOP's political journal. This year, she serves as The Gate's managing editor. Please join me in welcoming her to the podium. It is an honor and a privilege to welcome Alex Wagner to the University of Chicago and to the Institute of Politics today. Um, Alex's career in journalism spans over 15 years. She was the White House correspondent for Politics Daily, has worked at the Huffington Post, and, won as, and was an analyst for MSNBC. She also served as the executive director of Not On Our Watch Pro Project, a global human rights advocacy nonprofit. Alex hosted the Emmy-nominated program Now with Alex Wagner on MSNBC from 2011 to 2015 and previously anchored CBS This Morning Saturday. She is presently a national correspondent for CBS News, serves as a contributing editor to The Atlantic, and also co-hosts and is an executive producer of The Circus on Showtime. Alex's significant experience in political journalism has established her as one of the most respected voices in the field. She joins us today to discuss her new book, Future Face. In her book, she traces her roots back to Luxembourg and Burma in hopes of gaining insight into her family's history and into the larger questions of identity and origin. Today's conversation is particularly timely considering that these topics are currently at the forefront of American thought. Future Face prompts us to reflect on what it means to belong, especially during an era that is defined by change. This discussion will be moderated by Dr. Gina Samuels, an associate professor at the University of Chicago School of Social Service Administration. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Samuels and our guest, Alex Wagner. So, Alex, welcome. Thank you. It's a thrill to be here. It's always a thrill to be in Chicago, and it's a particularly selfish thrill that I am here before my husband, who went oh. to U of C and also has a book. So I consider this a huge win from yes. my side of the family, even though yes. I'm so happy to have my husband's family here in, yes. the, in the audience. Welcome, husband's family. <laughs> Alex and I were noting before that we also are dressed similarly. Yeah, so this was completely part of a un choir, un the unplanned. mixed race people's choir. Yes, we just we intuitively knew our outfit. So. You know, as somebody who has also done a lot of writing, I know that once you once you write something and you send it off into the universe, yes. there's a little bit of a, at least maybe I'm speaking for myself, attachment kind of anxiety. <laughs> and so I thought I thought maybe we'd get started <laughs> to see whether or not that is happening for you, but also to to ask, are there things that when when folks read your book that you're really wanting them to get out of it? What are the messages that you really want? And and second question. Um, are there fears or worries that you have in the message that you really want to make sure people don't under don't interpret from what you've written? Yeah, um, I I wrote this book when I began the book when Barack Obama was president, mm. and I finished it when Donald Trump was president. And my feelings about this country and sort of where we were on the fundamental mm -hmm. questions about Americanness and identity mm -hmm. changed dramatically. Um, 
And I think that in this particular moment of fracture, there's a lot to be very despondent about. But the thing I really want people to come away with at the end of this book is a feeling of hopefulness and a feeling of empathy and a feeling of curiosity, but, but really belief in our shared humanity. Um, so I hope people see that at the end mm -hmm. of the book, right? And a sense of kind of ownership over this moment, that it is up to us. Um, the thing that terrifies me is that, well, I mean, first of all, the book goes through a lot of different, I mean, it, it, it tackles genealogy, it tackles you know, colonialism, it tackles DNA-based ancestry science, mm -hmm. um, or ancestry-based DNA science. Um, and I, I worry a little bit, because I, I, I end the book with so much of a focus on the community of now, that people will think that means forsaking the story of who your family is. And that is not at all the case. I think it's great to learn about who your people are. But as far as that animating one's life and being determinative in terms of one's course of action or who you are, that's not what I believe. But ultimately, knowing more mm -hmm. and understanding and developing a sense of, sense of empathy around you know, your people who are less than is, is what I want people to understand about um, you know, genealogy and tracing your family roots. It's very good for you to do as sort of a citizenship exercise. Mm -hmm. And I hope that that is not lost in, in the reading of the book. Mm -hmm. You know, I think in my reading of the book, I was struck by uh, the quest for facts and how many times you would go and find facts and then seem dissatisfied with what you found. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, interesting. And the statements of, I even wrote down, you know, like, I would have to decide for myself and determine if this was enough and find where I really belonged for real this time. For real. And so what did you mean, like, for real? What were you well, hoping well, to there feel? Two, so there are two things. One is, I think, um, you know, in, independent of hashtag fake news, we, lo we are inclined <laughs> to read things and talk to people who validate our point of view. And if we have constructed this idea of who we are, I think we seek out information that validates that idea. And you know, to some degree, there was a, there's a huge part of the book that talks about my theoretical Jewish roots that had been mm -hmm. masked by this Catholic upbringing, <laughs> right? And I so badly want to find these Jewish I know roots you that do. I'm like, I know. I'm, like I'm like <laughs> scraping like uh -huh. you know the petri dish trying to find the evidence. Um, and I think that's what you're talking yeah. about when I kind of get to facts that are inconvenient in terms of this narrative that I very deeply, badly want to construct around my mm -hmm. family history. But then there's another piece of it, which goes to the quote that you just read, which is, when you look at history, sometimes you run into dead ends. When you're trying to unravel mysteries, sometimes you don't find the answer. Mm -hmm. And if you stake, you know, the, the sort of, um, if you put, the amount of emotional weight that I put on my own ancestor quest, which was, this is going to tell me where I belong. This is going to show me you know, what kind of person I am. When you don't get the answers that are neat and tidy or definitive or conclusive, it can be really frustrating. And the idea that you're going to have to determine for yourself what is enough information to draw the picture that you want to draw mm -hmm. is hard. And that's what that. <laughs> Quote gets to, mm -hmm. I think. And what do you think that the Jewish thing, the Jewish desire was about? Who here is Jewish? I mean, isn't it great? <laughs> I, I, you know, I think part of it, uh, so for people who haven't read the book, I highly encourage you to buy a copy. <laughs> um, I, I, my mom is from uh, Rangoon, Burma and is a fairly devout Buddhist. And my father was born in a tiny town in the Mississippi River in northern Iowa, northeastern Iowa, and came from a large Catholic family. Um, and because my parents had one child and were overwhelmed with having one child, they forgot to enroll me in, non, in, in secular nursery school. And so I ended up attending Mm -hmm. um, reformed Jewish nursery school. And I think that's where the seed, <laughs> the seed was, was planted. planted. I would came home and I was like, well, are you going to be Shabbat mother this week in class? <laughs> like the whole thing, the challah, like the mm -hmm. singing, the prayers. I unfortunately don't remember most of it now, but, um, but I think, and, and I, t there's a famous story, which is not in the book, a famous story in my own head. Um, <laughs> that I was on a bus with my mother and, um, I ran into a Catholic, we ran into a Catholic nun in her habit. And I, um, 
I went up to her and I said, oh, are you dressed up for Halloween? And she said, she said, no, I'm a Catholic nun. And I said, oh, <laughs> knowingly, this four-year-old me, I said, my daddy is Catholic. And she looked at my mother, who is clearly not white American, and she said, well, what is your mommy? And I said, my mommy is Buddhist. And she said, then what does that make you? And I said, I am a Jew. <laughs> and that is like, you know, sort of family lore, but I think, in that story is a kernel of, mm -hmm. of what I was looking for in this ancestor quest. Like, first of all, I love the idea of turning convention on its head, that I would be neither a Buddhist nor Catholic, but I'd be Something from this else. other place, yeah. right? Which is an exoticism, of course, which has its own, there's mm -hmm. baggage there. But also, Judaism is one of the oldest tribes, right? Like, if you're looking for something to belong to, here is a built-in community. Mm -hmm. When I first told my agent the story, he was like, I, I knew you were part of the tribe. I knew it. <laughs> and there is something so intoxicating about mm -hmm. that in a way that no one Burmese Luxembourgian had ever been like, you're part of our tribe. Mm -hmm. You know, I go to Burma mm -hmm. and they're like, are you from the Philippines? Like there was never, mm -hmm. I never, I never got that. You know, mm -hmm. I was, and I, I talk a lot about this in the book. I grew up in suburb, suburban, upper Northwest Washington, DC, which is sort of suburban mm -hmm. in, in, um, in environment. And I was a mixed race kid, but I didn't think of myself as a mixed race kid. I liked Garfield mm -hmm. and I liked Saved by the Bell and I liked Chips Ahoy. And it did not dawn on me that I was not American the way everyone else was until I was in a diner at the age of 12 and the line cook looked at me and said, are you adopted? Mm -hmm. He looked at my dad and he looked at me and said, are you adopted? And it was the first time I realized the exclusivity that, that is conferred with that sort of like tribal belonging mm -hmm. and how much I wanted to be a part of where everybody else was. Mm -hmm. And how much that ma makes a difference to be claimed by somebody. Absolutely. Right? Yeah, that um. sense of belonging is, I mean, it explains a lot about what's happening in politics today. Mm -hmm. You know, you go to Trump rallies, you go to rallies for Ayanna Presley and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, there is a strong <laughs> sense of, of tribe, of belonging, of kinship. And that goes back, that's as old as time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So growing up, did you, did you grow up around other mixed race people? What meaning did that have for you ever? I mean, I, I grew up in, in, as I said, in Washington, DC, and my mother would truck me out to suburban Maryland in mm. April, which is when Burmese New Year is. And they celebrate this thing, it's called Thin Jan. And as part of the Burmese New Year festival, it's known as the water throwing festival. April in Burma, it is hot. <laughs> so it makes sense to be in the streets throwing water on each other. Mm -hmm. But in suburban Washington, D.C., it's like 55 degrees. <laughs> and I just remember like cowering in the corner of someone's lawn as like 12-year-old boys ran mm -hmm. around with buckets like trying to That's throw water on people. Violent. Horrible. And I, I felt so alien, right? Mm -hmm. And at the same time, this was my... Mm -hmm. This was my maternal line. This was Burma. And mm -hmm. I didn't know Burmese. And my grandmother and mother never taught me Burmese because they liked talking about me in front of me in Burmese. Mm -hmm. um, and I love Burmese food, but I didn't have a relationship with the culture. At the same time, my dad decided that I was going to be Catholic, mm -hmm. not in fact Jewish. Um, and he would periodically drag me to Sunday school. And I didn't go regularly. I didn't know what was going on. I felt alien there, too. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of just found myself outside of the sort of twin poles of my identity and alone, mm -hmm, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and I talk about this in the book. At, at one point in high school, there's this Time magazine cover. It's 19, 19, mm -hmm, 1993, November, mm -hmm. and it's this picture. It's an amalgamation. It's a racial composite image, and it says, Behold, the new face of America. And it's a composite image of all the racial mm -hmm. sort of um, subsets that would come to be dominant in the next 30 years. And I looked at the cover image, and I was like, <laughs> That is me. me. I am the future <laughs> face. And that felt like belonging mm -hmm. for a little while. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm a brown person. You don't even need to know. I'm just broadly mixed race heritage, and I'm the mm -hmm. future. You can confuse me with a Native American, or a Hawaiian, or an Egyptian, or an Alaskan. Like, I don't care. Just know that I'm different from you, and I'm the future. Mm -hmm. And that's what I adopted for a while until it yeah. wasn't enough anymore. Yeah, and what made it not enough anymore? Because 
there's a weightlessness of being an avatar, right? I mean, first of all, they're the, they're divorcing yourself from any sort of racial history, I think, is intellectually dishonest, right? I mean, no story of race exists without a story of blood and plunder behind it. Mm -hmm. But also, it, there, is no, there is no grounding, sort of sustaining part of an identity that's basically just a made-up box. Right? And I think we have come to realize that as well in terms of multiculturalism. Like there is a sort of ecosystem in which we live together as brown people, but don't shortchange our individual identities and stories. And I, that came to me later on and was actually the beginning of this book. It's like, okay, I'm not just broadly mixed race. I am a person with these two these two stories behind me, mm -hmm. and I don't know those stories. So the book is about setting off to find the truth behind those stories. Mm -hmm. And so in, in your setting off for truth, what most surprised you in that journey? Of all of it? Of all of it. Oh, my Lord. It doesn't have to be one thing. I think, I think there, I'll say two things, because okay. there's one surprising thing on both sides. There's a surprising stuff on both sides, but my mom and grandmother came from Burma, and you know, Burma in their recollections was like this impossibly romantic place where it's like, you know, they were, they, they were like tootling around beautiful old colonial era buildings <laughs> in like the first Dodge motor car mm -hmm. to hit the Rangoon mm -hmm. streets. And my mother would walk to school carrying a palm leaf as an umbrella and smelling almond blossoms on her way to work and, or way to school. Mm -hmm. And it, just like romantic images that seemed like Narnia to me, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I had never really thought, well, if it was so good, why'd you leave? <laughs> you know, I knew things got bad in terms of the military government, but I had never really thought about the tensions mm -hmm. that had sort of erupted in the country. And my grandmother had all these kind of little racial epithets that were mm -hmm. racist epithets mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for the various racial subgroups in Burma. And I had always chalked that up to kind of like, oh, mm -hmm. my grandmother, whatever. You know, we often do this with mm -hmm. older people Just in our dismiss. family. We're like, well, those are your own bigotries or whatever. But actually, as I unwound the story of why she called certain people mm -hmm. certain things, I unwound the story of, of extraordinary genocide and racial tension in Burma and could locate my family story mm, right in, in and around yeah. what was happening, the tensions between Muslims in the country and the dominant Buddhist majority. And as I did this in real time, mm -hmm. in the 21st century, almost in the 20th century, right now is unfolding the genocide of the Rohingya Muslim minority in Burma. Mm -hmm. And I had never thought that that was tied Mm -hmm. to Burmese history, to my family story. And I realized through the course of this research that like, we don't leave things behind. First of all, bad things happened back home yeah. before we got to the new world. And racial animosity, us versus them, tension around migrants and brown-skinned people, even if they're just more brown-skinned than you, that's a recurrent theme in history. And the fault lies with us when we don't recognize that and don't learn the lessons from the past. So that was hugely instructive mm -hmm. and really important in terms of something I found on my mother's side. And then on my father's side, you know, it was such, it was such a simple detail, but he told this story about his amazing Rockwellian childhood and playing stickball in the streets. And I remember as I was talking to my dad, he said something, he was like, oh, you know, there were the Episcopalians, and then there were the Protestants, and da-da-da-da-da. He was kind of outlining all the various tribes of his small Iowa town. And he said offhandedly, there was only one person of color. He was a black man. He was a dry cleaner. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know, it's so weird. I had never sort of like wondered, what, where, where were all the people of color in, <laughs> in, in your part of Iowa? And I started doing research, and I realized <laughs> there were lots of people of color in Iowa in the 1850s, right before my great-grandfather mm -hmm. got there. They were Native Americans. They were the Winnebago tribe, mm -hmm. who literally had been there like five minutes before my great-grandfather arrived. Mm -hmm. And it had never occurred to me that this family garden that had been the site of all of these vegetables and fruits that my grandmother had harvested for family suppers after Sunday mass, that that soil, that land, had been owned by someone else. And it had, those people had been kicked off the land, decimated, and effectively murdered. Mm -hmm. And that we never thought about the debt we owed them, you know? 
it wasn't as if I expected the Wagner family to pay reparations to the, the, the Winnebago. Mm -hmm. But when you tell the story of how we came to be and how we grew big and strong in America, you have to tell the story of mm -hmm. who sowed that ground to begin with. And I felt like, wow, when I tell my son, because I was pregnant mm -hmm, at the time mm -hmm. I was like wrapping up this book, which is an insanity onto itself, but I realized that I can tell this family history starting at a different point. And I'm going to start in 1845, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. when they were still in Alamakee County, and it, and it truly belonged to the Native people. And from there, I can tell the story of the Wagner mm -hmm. family. Mm -hmm. And that was enlightening and, and interesting and shocking and revelatory. Yeah. Yeah, and so I, one of my questions was, you know, thinking thinking about you as a storyteller for your own story and with your son, how what are the different stories that you were told that you'll maybe include? Yeah, and keep or I'm going to tell them we're shift. Jewish. Okay, that <laughs> uh, um, I'm Jewish. My yes. husband is Jewish. Yes. Um, uh, you know, I think I. First of all, I think we have to be. In the course of researching all of this, you find a lot of unsavory characters in your family, right? And like, there's kind of like, an, there's the people get off on having criminals mm -hmm. in their background. Mm -hmm. They're like, he was a pirate. He was blah blah blah. Um, but I actually think if you if you draw a specific picture for your children of people who made bad decisions and were complicated people and maybe had compromised morals, it's important. Because in the present day, there are a lot of people in this world who have compromised morals and are unsavory characters, <laughs> and yet they're an important part of our lives. Mm -hmm. They're an important part of our democracy. They're, they're, they're Americans, too. I mean, one of the things that all of this research did was, I mean, it really, I developed a sense of empathy. Mm -hmm. You know, um, people, are bro people break themselves, people are broken, people are broken by circumstance. And the more you learn specifically about the humanity of your people, I think the more it prepares you to be empathetic and forgiving about the people in your present. Um, and so I think, you know, when I tell the story of our aunts, our great, you know, my son's size, great, great grandparents, mm -hmm. I'm gonna talk about the bad stuff, not in a romantic way, but in a real way. Mm -hmm. You know, like, oh, we were responsible for economic calamity in Burma. A lot mm -hmm. of people lost a lot of money because of bad decisions that we made or, or, or us looking the wrong way or not doing mm -hmm. our jobs mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. And like, that doesn't excuse it, but that's what happened. And people make mistakes, and this is part of learning. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I'll also say, like, I want him to know all of this stuff, mm -hmm. but then I think the important thing, because this is the thing I came away with at the end of the book, is to understand that, like, he is more than the sum of his history, right? Mm -hmm. He is going to go do things that I can't imagine doing yep. and live in a world that I can't possibly fathom. And I want him to always, as, as, as grounded as I, I want him to be in the history, I also want him to feel free about the future and the present. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's like a very careful balance in terms of, you know, as a parent, how I synthesize everything that I learned mm -hmm. in the book. And leave spaces open for him to imagine. Yeah, yeah something absolutely. Yeah. Huge. Imagine something that's completely different. Mm -hmm. I mean, one thing, one thing you, you know, definite, we know definitively about our, our time on this thin part of the Earth's crust as Homo sapiens is that we are bound for travel and change. I mean, that's what makes us Americans. That's what makes us Homo sapiens. We all started in one place. We, we've moved to different parts of the globe. We're getting closer together through trade and marriage and globalization and FedEx. And, <laughs> and Amazon Prime. And, and we're becoming more similar. But mm -hmm. we, we move and we change and we grow. And those are almost the immutable constants about human life. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that, along that line that I talk with my students about is as we individually change and grow, not everybody changes and grows with us in our family. True story. So I'm curious about how, as you've done this journey, how have other family members responded <laughs> to your quest for the truth? And this is, yes, this is a good question, <laughs> Doc. Yeah, um, just curious. My mother wants everyone to know that she thinks I am being overly harsh about her racist okay. attitudes towards the Chinese. Noted. So I'm telling you all, duly noted. my mother <laughs> believes that I have been unduly harsh about her, okay. what I term a racist attitudes towards the Chinese. Okay. Not everyone is happy with the book, yeah. you know? But as a testament, my, uh, I mean, I don't want to, there's some spoilers. Some okay. people did not live to see the end of this yeah. book who are featured prominently in the book, so I never got their takes. 
Um, but my mom, I, who is centrally located in the plot line and has, you know, there are plenty of unsavory things mm -hmm. in there. It's a testament to her and her resilience and her curiosity about the world that she thinks it's a great book. And she, you know, is angry about certain mm -hmm, parts of mm -hmm. it, but she's really happy that we laid out our Burmese bigotries because she thinks many Burmese people need to reconcile mm -hmm. their bigotries, mm -hmm, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think she's one of those people that wishes she could be a better person, even if she succumbs to some <laughs> of our worst instincts sometimes, right? Yeah. Which is a step towards progress. Um, you know, I think parts of my family are really happy I did the research, especially my dad's side, because so much of it had been shrouded in like mystery and it's work. I mean, mm -hmm. like I was it on internet chat rooms in Belgium, you know, like who wants to do that on a mm -hmm. Saturday night? Absolutely mm -hmm. no one. Mm -hmm. Maybe some of you do. Yeah, um, really. <laughs> on second thought, maybe. Yeah. yeah, I mean, like I went to the archives in, in Luxembourg City and was like looking through 17, 16, 1800s, 18th century birth certificates. Like it is mm -hmm. detective work and it is hard and mm -hmm. it is like mind numbing sometimes. So they were happy. But then like my uncle refuses to read the book because mm -hmm. he read one chapter oh. about my grandmother and he was like, I'm not reading, this I'm is done. garbage. Like, you, you, like I knew her, she wasn't like that, mm -hmm. how dare you? Mm -hmm. And I fully respect that, mm -hmm. you know? Like part of, one thing I tried to be in the book is honest but fair. And I think, again, you can read this book and come away understanding the, the tenderness I still feel for the most complicated elements in my family, you know? I mean, that's family, right? Mm -hmm. Like, they do dumb, awful shit and say dumb, awful shit sometimes, but they're still mm -hmm. your family. And sometimes you can still find a way to love them. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I don't think any, you never lose the sight of the love mm -hmm. in the book, I mm -hmm. hope. I think so, I would agree. So what, what did you learn about belonging? It's a big theme throughout the book. It's yeah. part of why you began the journey, I think. Yeah. And where are you at with how you would explain to people how Belong. you get it? The how answer, it? the like, in, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, so I was looking in the rear view mirror for a sense of belonging, right? Like a sense of a, a, tri a mystical tribe of elders, as I call yeah. them in the book, who are gonna confer upon me this irrefutable membership in some cosmic tribe. and. It happened when, I think it really happened when I was in Esch, Luxembourg. And it is, man, it is, there are some white places in the country. That is the whitest place I have ever, ever been. Really? been. Yes. Okay. People walk around in polo shirts, like with their po collars popped, just mm -hmm. like that's what just they like do. That. It was like crazy, right? And I felt so alien. I was like, this has not, this place has nothing to do with me. I'm not this. This is n like, I'm here. But like, you know, ancestral tourism is a whole industry. People, and, and legit, I mean, mm -hmm. people will go back to Ghana, mm -hmm. to the areas where the slave ships first launched mm -hmm. from, and they feel something when yeah. they put foot to soil, right? I did not feel any of that when I got mm -hmm. to Luxembourg City and Esch Luxembourg. But I found myself after, I don't know, I was like traipsing around trying to find a family home that had long since been destroyed. And I ended up in a Donner kebab shop which was like <laughs> the only other right. brown folks in town or the, just like the people that didn't belong. And I was like, God, I'm so glad I found this kebab shop. And all kebab shops have the same hero poster with like the woman and the lamb on the spit. <laughs> the and I was like, I'm home, I'm home. <laughs> and I realized, I was like, I belong in a place where there are all kinds of different people. Mm -hmm. And I got back to New York City and I was riding the subway and there's like, you know, if you get on the subway late night enough, this used to happen in my 20s when I rode the subway more late at night, but you could get on cars where like everybody is kind of like sleeping because mm -hmm. they're drunk or they're tired or whatever. But it's this magical moment when you feel like, oh man, these are, these this are is my, my tribe. Like this is, this, this cacophonous, insane mm -hmm. place which is not limited to New York City. It could be Delhi, mm -hmm. it could be Detroit, it could be Chicago. You know, but this, and it's not just about like, you know, a liberal enclave, but this place full of change and mess and anger and emotion and all kinds of different people coming and just fighting to survive because they believe in this thing and they just want to be here. Mm -hmm. That's my community. And it occurred to me that like, it's not in the past. And we so badly, I think in America, particularly in this moment, want to go back to this halcyon past that maybe didn't even really exist because that's when things were better. Like this time is our time on this planet. This is what we got. I mean, I would like to believe in a hereafter, but we don't have any definitive proof that that exists. 
And you can believe in that spiritually, but as a practical matter, like this is our time and these are the people we've been given. And it really, at the end of the day, I thought I belong to all of these people. They belong to me. We're in it together. And this is the community that I'm a part of. And this is what I'm going to invest in. And I really feel like ever since I've wrote, written the book, I am much more engaged in relationships, mm -hmm. uh, strangers, you know, the, 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 the normal, like observant of, of the, the, the random assortment of characters that cross my visual radar every day. Because that's, you know, when you die, those are the images that are going to pass across that's your true. eyelids. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and I'm struck with what you said before about how moving it was for you, for people to reach out to you and say you belong, even when there was no necessarily facts to ground that, that the, that the feeling of relationality and belonging is in the soul and not cellular. Yeah. And it's relational. And so I wonder, because we still very much think about identity, particular for people who are mixed race, as this quest of confusion and mm -hmm. where do I belong, and that that somehow is the hallmark characteristic of being mixed in yeah. some kind of way. So, what would you say to people, either people who aren't mixed, yeah. you know, but or people who are, about sort of owning that that normativity of confusion? <laughs> what, what have you well, learned so about? What would you say? So many mixed race people have come up to me and said. I, this book was my story. Like, mm -hmm. I got it, you mm -hmm. know? And that's a beautiful thing. Because like you said, you write a book and then you launch it out into the world and, and you like, don't know who's ah. going to read it and how they're going to interpret it. And it was so meaningful to me mm -hmm. and also so eye-opening because I had such a specific background, right? And it's like, how many Burmese Luxembourgers are going to mm -hmm. read this book? Zero. And like, it isn't Burmese. Like, mm -hmm. there's such common universal themes of searching and loss and you know, desire, right, mm -hmm. that are common, but to everybody. And I think at the same time, there are tons of white Americans that have come up to me and been like, I've been trying to find my people too. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is our human struggle, is to find the place where we belong, right? And at the same time, reconcile that with this, this search for change and, and evolution and this drive to, to, to new frontiers, mm -hmm. right? Um, I tell people, I mean, I, I, I think it, it's in sort of, I don't mean to be redundant, but the, the investment in people that you meet and acquiescing to the idea that they are your people, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. and that that's okay. You know, like the, the, the people that don't look like you and don't have anything in common with you, regardless of whether you're mixed race or white, like that's, that's your tribe. And to embrace that. That doesn't have to be your only tribe, mm -hmm. but insofar as you're looking for, you know, that immediate sense of belonging, once you relent to that, it's incredibly empowering. And so how would you suggest someone do that who's so caught up in the, but I have to know and I have to feel I, like, I think you should still know. I mean, like, like I said, this is one of the sort of like complicated caveats of the book. Yeah. Go look for the truth about who you are, mm -hmm. right? Don't do it in an ancestry, DNA-based ancestry <laughs> test, because that's, that's going to, it's just, la first of all, lazy. The science is oftentimes wrong. Mm -hmm. And like, you know what you're going to do. You're going to take the spit test, and then it's going to tell you you're like 2% Scottish or 0.5% Iberian. And you're going to be like, see, I'm crazy different than the rest of you, which is not the point. I mean, if the point is to learn who your people were and find out their stories and perhaps grow as a human being, that doesn't come through pop science. Mm -hmm. That comes through work and conversation, calling your grandparents, asking them their stories. I mean, there is a, a certain amount of sweat that you need to put in, right? But knowing your people is not bad. I think you can reconcile that. I think you can have that. Mm -hmm. I think you can take that knowledge and still be OK with investing in the present in a community that has nothing to do with your own shared uh, racial background or, or cellular makeup. And I know that's complicated, mm -hmm. especially in this time. But I think that that's the only way we move forward. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So if you think about kind of moving forward in such a, in such a moment in time when tribe is political yeah. and political is racial and class, and what's the message to society for folks who simultaneously find meaning in sort of looking inward? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, this is really hard. I really kind of wish Barack Obama was still president when I finished this book, because it would have made, made all the lesson making a lot easier. Um, 
It's really, it, look, it is not without its challenges, mm -hmm. right? I mean, at this moment, American politics isn't just about, it is so deeply emotional, the split between the two halves of our country, mm -hmm. that to suggest like, oh, see them as human beings and fellow Americans feels like some Pollyannish, mm -hmm. like ridiculous proposition. But, I mean, I think we cannot, I, I constantly remind myself of this, right? First of all, it hasn't always been this bad. And second of all, we are in this together. And if you believe in the project, you have to believe there's a way we work it out. Mm -hmm. And like, I, I really think, I mean, now that I'm married, I think I really understand this lesson. Mm -hmm. You know, like there are moments in a marriage where you're like, I will kill you. <laughs> like, this is it. How could I have chosen you? <laughs> and like things are said mm -hmm. and like you mean them. You do. You really you mean really them. Do. And then days pass. Mm -hmm. And you remember that you're married, right? <laughs> and maybe even that you love the person. Mm -hmm. I'm not even saying we have to remember that we love each other. But I do think the project of the United States is a glorious one. Mm -hmm. And it is responsible for a lot of innovation and good in the world. And I do think that this country is motivated. I mean, I think that there are really good people that have been deeply misguided over the course of the last mm -hmm. few years. But they're not lost. And I believe that if, if we are invested in this idea of our democracy and these United States, we have got to, as the bigger people in the room, whoever we are, figure out how we're gonna get back together. Because that's the only way it survives. It can't survive as it is right now. Mm -hmm. And so maybe it's not even like a lesson to be drawn, but a reminder to keep in the back of our heads, mm -hmm. right? And you can, you can use whatever strategy you have. Mine is by being, trying to be empathetic and actually to see their humanity as Pollyannish as it is. Your coping strategy may be different, but mm -hmm. never lose sight of the fact that this is our thing together and it is a marriage. Mm -hmm. yeah, as imperfect as, as we imperfect, all are. There is no divorce court for this. I mean, I, we tried it in 1860, it didn't yes, go so we did. well. Yes, we did. So, you know, let's figure out a way to figure it out. So is there anything, I'm recognizing we're almost at our time to wrap up, and, but I was curious about if there was anything that didn't make it into the book that you wish did, or that looking back you would have pulled out? Oh my God, there's, I mean like, the book would have been like 100 a pages, pages if yes. I had, it would have been a long <laughs> pamphlet that I published, uh, you know, last week um what what you know i i wish i had had more time with my dad mm -hmm. in particular yeah. to explore some of the implications of what i found and i wish yeah. i i didn't actually get that time mm -hmm. but i wish if i had to rewrite the book i mean it was left out because it never right. existed but that is something I really regret. And I would tell everybody in this audience, this is like such a tedious hallmark thing to say, but like call your, your people. people. Yeah. It is so underrated. Nobody does it anymore. People do it on holidays. People write emails. Have a conversation yeah. with the eldest people in your family. Record it. Mm -hmm. You will never get that time again and you will never regret having done that. Mm -hmm. And. I wish I had been able to do more of that in, in my research. I wish I had more of that in the book. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What, do, what do you imagine your dad would say? You know, he was um, a very uh, complicated person mm -hmm. and very resistant to some of the theories that I was pursuing. Emerging throat. Mm -hmm. And that was um, a really good sounding, you know, the white immigrant origin story. Mm -hmm. It's he strong. He really encapsulated yeah. He, he really was an avatar of that in a way that I didn't fully realize until I really got into it with him. Um, I, what was the question? What would he have said? <laughs> I think I, 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 would have, I would have grilled him more mm -hmm. about his sense of nationalism, which was a, a liberal sense of nationalism, yeah. but a very specific, Still. you know, he, in another like world in the Twilight Zone, he could have been one of those Midwest Democrats that flipped to Trump. Mm -hmm. He never, mm -hmm. ever would mm -hmm. have. Mm -hmm. but. You could see. Yeah, I could have the, see. Mm -hmm. I can see how some of that nationalism mm -hmm. would have swung. You know, would have been intoxicating to sort of like him in in a certain way. Um, so I would have grilled him more. I grilled him more, and I would have grilled my dad more. Um, <laughs> and I and I think I would have. I think I would have tried to understand better how and why he made emotionally the choices that he made mm. to 
to be the kind of person he wanted to be and think the certain things he wanted to about this country. Mm -hmm. And what would he have thought about your Jewish theory? He would have, I mean, he did. He did yeah, not like he it. he didn't. He couldn't, he couldn't handle it. Mm -hmm. You know, he was so grounded in this particular strain of Catholic democratic politics mm -hmm. that is animating, it continues to be in American life. And to suggest that he was Jewish was like, no way. It's too far. It's too far. And look, I mean, I, haven't, I never grew up with the compass points that he did. Mm -hmm. And they were very clearly outlined in his life. And I can understand how completely upending it would have been to, to suggest that he was something else, something else right? Like, yeah. And I, I sort of understand the resistance. To ask. Right, I'm a, I'm a different human. Mm -hmm. um, but I would have wanted to probe more about why. <laughs> Yes, yes, and any of you who read, read the book knows that that is a key feature of Alex. Yes, probing. You're a true prober. A prober. You're completely a true <laughs> prober. So I'm sensitive to time, and I realize we've got like two minutes, but I'm okay with also turning it over to, to students if you have some questions. Hi. Um, thank you so much for coming. Um, so I wanted to ask or for you to talk a little bit about your thoughts on how race factors into this idea of like an American identity because I do think there's a very sort of fixed idea of yes. what it means to be American and that's something that mm -hmm. I think a lot of people of color or people with like immigrant families struggle with so I wanted to sort of hear your perspective on how that factors into the formation of that. Well sentiment. I think it undergirds the conversation right now about yeah. who is us yeah. and who is them right and in, in, in sort of equally opposite measures right there's one part of the country that someone like Steve King is an interlocutor for who mm -hmm. believes that diluting your bloodline with brown people makes you less American, yeah. right? That, that the American sort of project is diminished the less white it gets. I mean, make America great again is almost an explicit call back to a more homogenous and white society, right, that was fantastically great. Um, at the same time, you know, there are other parts of the country, largely cities and rural, uh, suburb, cities and suburban areas increasingly that are much more mixed and where being American is by nature an inclusive proposition. And the question is, how do you square those things in a way that's fair? Because I, nobody ever says this, but people, I mean, the exclusivity that is at the root of white nationalism is, is, is not right. But the ability of Irish German Americans to celebrate their heritage and not necessarily their whiteness, that needs to be allowed somewhere. And we have to figure out a way for people to feel like they can be who they are and proud of who they are without it feeling demonstrably exclusive to the rest of us. And that's the tension of America right now, right? And it is exacerbated by the fact that the next 20 years are gonna see demographic change that is rapid and in one direction only. Right? And we're beginning to grab the, the, all of the things that are happening right now, from birtherism to Trumpism, are an expression of that tension and that anxiety around a, a one America being rising and the other one being seen as on the losing side demographically. Um, and I do think it's up to those with more power and better education and more resilient communities to fig and it's not fair, but it is up to them to figure out the inclusive dialogue and how to, how to lead that. Hi, thank you so much for being here. My name is Angela and I'm a third year in the college. Uh, my question is, what can universities do to promote these sort of discussions around race and identity and looking to your past and kind of understanding the different actors in it? You can have me back. Uh, you could add the course, the book to your course syllabus. syllabus. Um, <laughs> you know, look, I think, I, I think it's, I, First of all, people need to talk to each other about this. I think you need to have, I mean, I think led discussions are all, professors like this one, right? I mean, I think it's reading, I think, it, I think it's reading literature, not just nonfiction, but fiction literature that tells stories from different points of view, from different parts of American mm -hmm. history, not just contemporary literature, but literature from the 1800s and 1900s. It's hugely illustrative in terms of, when you read these early settlers' accounts of their sort of forays onto Native American, into Native American tribes, it's eye-opening, the, 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 the sort of culture clashes, but it's also an incredible sort of guide for what's happening right now, right? Um, but mostly, I think it is about cultivating um, 
an environment of, of that, that is filled with curiosity, right? The, the thing that is most damaging about this moment is everybody has retreated into their corners. And we have, and it's not just about empathy, it's about being legitimately curious about why people think what they think and how they got to that point. I mean, one of the things, if you go to places that, you know, your friends would never hang out in where you don't know anybody, you have to think of this moment as almost an anthropological exercise and like, Figure out how these people came to be the way that they are. You don't have to like it. You don't have to agree with it. But that is part of the project of getting to be better citizens and being more informed about the world. I think we need to think instead of reacting to everything, let us first be curious and question it. And then you can come up with your assessment afterwards. And I think that colleges and universities should better foster that. Thank you. Hi, you had briefly brought up the um, idea of reparations when you were talking about Native American yeah. history. And I was wondering, to what extent do you think that the individual should feel responsible for the past actions of their ancestors? And as a society, how should we think of the past actions of uh, our country as it used to be? That's just a light question to just round out the student uh, <laughs> question. Um, it's a very good question. Thank you for answering, uh, asking it. I wish you could answer it as well and take it off my plate. Um, look, I think, um, you know, financially, it is unrealistic to imagine, for example, that the Wagners of uh, Lansing, Iowa, are going to pay reparations to the Winnebago. I think the, in the we are indebted um, to the people that we have mistreated or cheated or taken things from by being honest about what happened, presenting a full accounting of what happened, and telling that story over and over again so that it doesn't keep happening, right? I mean, I think being upfront, being honest about, about sins, because that's really what they were, is the first step to making sure that stuff never happens again, but also it is part of the apology, if you will, right? That is, that is, I think, a fair one to ask of this contemporary generation. Um, you know, Ta-Nehisi Coates, who, who, who is someone that I work with at The Atlantic and who I did some book events with, is probably the most brilliant thinker on all of this. And he is, I mean, I think you have to also consider different experiences require different handling. Um, and the, the sort of like trauma and the plunder of the black community, I don't think is something that ended after slavery. It has taken on a different form and it uh, perhaps a less toxic, deadly form in some ways, although not, not deadly. Um, and I think the way we talk about how to reconcile that debt is different than we talk about how to reconcile the debt that we have with um, Japanese Americans, for example, right? They're all debts and <laughs> it's all bad, but some of it is more ongoing then than others. Uh, hi, my name's Kenny. I'm a local resident of the neighborhood. I appreciate your uh, TV commentary. Oh, thanks. And, uh, but I wanted to ask you, um, I'm a World War II uh, person, and um, I know about the history of Burma under the Japanese oh, rule. Oh, yes. yes, And I was curious, did you have any family in the resistance or who were in the Burmese army with the British? Um, not in the army. My mother was born as bombs were falling on Rangoon. My, my grandmother had, they had to evacuate Rangoon, and she was actually born in Tlegu, which is right outside of Rangoon. Um, and my grandmother has had a fierce animosity towards the Japanese that will never, it's never re reconciled, I think, for some obvious reasons. Um, we were one of those upper class families that was involved in the government, but not in the military. Um, and once the military took over, once there was a coup in the 1960s, they were decidedly not our people and looked to sort of punish the Burmese elite, the cosmopolitan elite. And they were really the driving force behind why my family left under cover of night in 1963. So, um, so we don't have any relations to them, and certainly not the modern day iteration of the Burmese military, which is responsible for some of the most heinous genocidal crimes in the world. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ellen. Um, I'd like to, as a full-blooded Ashkenazic Jew, I'd like to welcome you to the <laughs> tribe anytime. I've been waiting for you, Alex. Given that the host of this event is the Institute of Politics, I wanted to ask you, a political question Please. around identity, and that is around Elizabeth Warren and her 
Native American claims oh, and the genetic testing <laughs> and you know the Trump response and so on and so forth. I just find that really uh, distasteful, but also compelling. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the back and forth between, if you find the back and forth between Trump and Elizabeth Warren compelling, wait till 2020. Because um, <laughs> that's what that all was, mm -hmm. basically. I will say, just politically, strategically, I thought the Warren team bungled the release of that spectacularly. Mm -hmm. The fact that they didn't consult with any tribal leaders before they did this, it was just like, this is not a good indicator for how well run this campaign is, is at present. It's, a, of course, not an, an official campaign. Um, I, I don't even, honestly, I don't, I don't know what to say except that the DN, I mean, from a science perspective, the testing for Native American blood is a very contested part of ancestry-based DNA science. The scientists in these labs tell me they can tell you definitively whether you are Sioux, whether you are Iroquois, what have you. Um, you know, Elizabeth Warren sees herself as part of a tribe. And she is identified with this, and her family is identified with this for quite some time. And I think it is a very philosophical conversation we can get into. Like, what does it actually mean to be of a people, right? Like, how authentically, how much does your blood have to, have to register on the DNA scale for you to claim Native American heritage? Or by virtue of a cultural identification and some fractal part of your DNA, is that enough? I don't think that's a conversation we're going to have um, in the context of American politics, because I think, unfortunately, the point of all of this is humiliation. Um, and I think it's really dangerous when we tie, when, when, we, when identity and humiliation start intersecting, right? People shouldn't be made fun of because of what they think they are. Donald Trump thinks he's one thing, and a lot of people don't think he's that. <laughs> um, and I fear for the way this, this topic of, of identity, who belongs here, who belongs, and who doesn't, has been polarized and politicized. And I, I fear that it's going to get even worse in the coming years if, if the midterm elections and the strategy coming out of the White House relating to, for example, a caravan of migrants seeking refuge in the United States, if, if we're going to weaponize this. But I would expect that we're going to hear a lot more about controversies like this in the coming years. Hi there. Um, now that you've told your story, I was wondering if your reporter's instincts will drive you to ferret out other people who have interesting stories <laughs> like that. Uh, for example, uh, a few years ago, the only uh, Jewish ball player in the major leagues was a black man from the Dominican Republic by the name of Jose Bautista, mm. who married a white Jewish woman from Venezuela. We currently have um, a very good uh, ball player playing for the Chicago Bears. Uh, a black man by the name of Tariq Cohen, who has no idea how the family got that name. So there are a lot of interesting stories. I wonder if you. I might sense a baseball up. theme here. <laughs> Is it ball players you want me to research, or just interesting Americans? Interesting Americans. I've just given you a couple examples. <laughs> just, I, uh, just by way of an example. Full disclosure: I write part time for a sports. Okay, 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 okay. <laughs> I got you. I got you. Um, my husband is a former baseball player, so I'm sure he would be very interested in this line of investigation. I'm sorry, your husband's name is Sam Cass. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah, not a professional ball player to his chagrin, but um, <laughs> but baseball figures prominently in our household. Um, I, you know, I think I think less than doing genealogical research about people. What I am interested in is how people's families and how their histories make them and shape them and, and make them into the people they are. You know, I mean, our president is a great example of that. His family story is incredibly illustrative in terms of the man he's become today. And I think, you know, um, it doesn't have to be determinative, but I think it is absolutely enlightening to know um, the, the environment that created the people who are making our laws and who are leading the country and um, changing conversation. So I mean, I think it, it has offered me perspective, if not exactly marching orders for my next stories. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Anyone else? <laughs> What's the next book? 
Oh, there, w oh, there will be no next book. No, <laughs> there is. There are many projects afoot, but as yet, there, there's no, there is no book planned as yet. Though this book does come out in paperback next year, and I highly encourage everyone to <laughs> get a copy of it. Any, any episodes of Circus that's yes, maybe Yes, and we'll, for uh, those of you who have already purchased the book, I also have a show on Showtime called The Circus, which is a weekly political documentary that's coming back at the end of January, which is awesome. It's the best show on television. It synthesizes brilliantly everything that's happening in our national politic. And I'm on CBS News, and I write for The Atlantic and host their weekly podcast, Radio Atlantic. So you can, if you are not bored of me by the end of this evening, there are many other projects that I'm... Uh, participating in. That is a good question. There's a lot of eating and drinking on the circus. I, I feel like the Food Network has a higher bar for content. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Yeah? Good? Okay. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming this evening. Thank you, guys. Thank you.